All right, so we're moving into psychometric applications. Psychrometric, that, that's a brand new word, I'm sure, to everybody or most people in this room. It's the study of air and vapor, water vapor in the air. It's the study of moist air. That's what psychrometrics is. When I'm confronted with a brand new word, I often look for the definition in the dictionary or an encyclopedia, but that's now a little old because I have an online dictionary or encyclopedia. So I looked it up in Wikipedia, and it uh, talks about psychrometry or hygrometry. It's psychrometrics. It's all a field of engineering. That's nice. Uh, talking about the physical and thermodynamic properties of gas vapor mixtures. You can look at the Greek words from which they derive the current word psychrometrics. Okay? There's a lot that we need to cover. Some of it's very simple, like what is dry air? Okay, well dry air is uh, air with no water vapor. That's all it is. It's no water. Well, what is the standard description that engineers use for dry air? Well, they would say that it's around 78% nitrogen, N2. It's about 21% oxygen, has a little bit of argon, has a little bit of carbon dioxide, and other things. Now, if you look at the air that's in this room, it's definitely not dry, there's water vapor. It's also look at the air in this room, there's a lot more carbon dioxide in it than only 0.03%. It's, it's at least triple that in this room right now, okay? It's at least 0.09%, at least. Um, and if you keep exhaling, it'll go up, right? That's what you're doing. You're putting in water vapor and carbon dioxide. What are the other things? Well, some gases. Maybe there's a little methane. Don't ask me how it got here, right? All right, so now you may ask, calculate the molar mass of dry air. What you would do is you would say the molar mass of a mixture known as dry air, mixture being nitrogen, oxygen, blah, 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 is the sum of the mole fractions times the molar mass of each constituent. We'd say, what's the molar mass of N2? Well, it's around 28. You want more digits? 28.02. How about for oxygen? 16 and 16, that's 32. And if you want more digits, it's still 32.00. Argon, argon 39.94. Carbon dioxide, CO2, that's around 44. Now, what about the other? Treat it as carbon dioxide, 44.01. You make the, the multiplication of the mole fraction times each of the molar masses. Then you sum them up, and you'll get the... 28.97 molar mass for dry air. You say, Professor, that looks like the number that's in our textbook on table A1, the second line down. It sure is, 28.97. Should you trust it to four significant digits? No, as soon as you start pumping out you know, carbon dioxide. So it starts to move. So it's good to three digits. We often quote it to four and use it to four, but it's and it's dry. How many times do you really have dry air? Very rare. Calculate the density of dry air at 1 atm and 25 degrees C. How would we do that? So what symbol do we like to use? Rho for the density? It's kilograms per meter cubed. Kilograms of what? Dry air. It's kilograms of nitrogen and oxygen and carbon dioxide and argon, but we would all just lump that together and say kilograms of dry air in what? Per cubic meter that the dry air occupies. Okay. How would we calculate rho? Use the ideal gas equation. PV is equal to RT or P is equal to rho RT. True. So it's going to be P over RT. Somebody says... I like to put the R bar there, which means I need the molar mass of the dry air. 
So I often will calculate density as PM divided by R bar T. So you say 1 ATM, that's 101.3 kilopascal. The molar mass of dry air, 28.97 kilograms of dry air per kilomole of dry air. 8.314 kilojoules, or a kilojoule is a kilopascal times a meter cubed. True. One kilojoule is one kilopascal times a meter cubed. Do you like it or not? And so when I use R and I need to work about pressures and volumes, I like that form. Okay. Divided by kilomole. Kelvin, and the temperature, I need to add 273, that's 298 Kelvin. Now notice that I, 273, did I add 273.15? We just, I don't know why, but we only keep three digits on temperatures, <laughs> and yet you'll see students, you know, and I get all worked up about, I think I can get four significant digits on the density. You didn't get the temperature to more than three. <laughs> Make sense? So anyway, this you can compute. It looks like it's 1.1845 kilograms per meter cubed. Again, it's really inconsistent. I only got three significant digits. I got four or five to this answer. Round it off. There you go. Okay. Yeah, you could put, put one eight. You're not going to lose points if you put 1.9, okay? Uh, or the inverse of that, the specific volume, 0 0.844 meters cubed per kilogram of what? Kilogram of dry air. A lot of times I'll emphasize that's a kilogram of dry air because we're about ready to start talking about moist air, having water vapor in the same cubic meter, in the same cubic meter. That can get confusing. So you talk about adding water vapor. So you go from dry, if you add a little bit of water vapor, it becomes moist. And then you can add more water vapor, more water vapor. And then you get to a point where it's full. It's saturated air. OK, saturated air. Think about if I have a piston cylinder apparatus, and the piston only conceptually allows me to keep it at constant pressure. I start off with nothing but dry air in here. It's the right mix of nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide, argon. It's dry air. It's got a pressure. The pressure, let's say, is 101.3 kilopascal. Atmospheric pressure, right? I then somehow introduce a lower, on the bottom of it, a liquid layer of water, liquid water, okay? Dry air on top of a liquid water. What's going to happen to some of that liquid water? It's going to evaporate. So molecular molecules of water are going to come off. They're going to have energy to get away, break those intermolecular forces that hold it in the liquid state, and off it goes into the vapor. And then there's another molecule, and he's up here floating around a water vapor. And here's a water vapor, and that one goes and hits the wall. And then it bounces off. There's one here, and it goes down and strikes the water. When it strikes the water, it could get the intermolecular forces could keep it together with the other water molecules in the liquid. But after a while, some will have come off of the liquid, and some will be going back to the liquid, but there'll be no more net exchange. I'll reach equilibrium. And then we talk about this air that's above has its saturated air. It's saturated. It's, it's a new equilibrium. There's the maximum amount of water vapor in it. If I wait any longer, it's not going to get more water vapor up there. I started. It was dry air. I waited. It, more water vapor went up, 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 and then finally it's saturated air. True? Okay. When I look at this, I like to think of it as a binary. What do you mean by binary? Binary mixture of ideal gases. Well, 
That means two components to this ideal gas. It's binary in the sense that it's dry air plus water vapor. That's, what it's, that's how engineers look at this. We say, oh, it's binary mixture, dry air. Now we know that dry air has nitrogen, oxygen, but it gets too complicated. Or not complicated, tedious, that's what I should say. So what's the total pressure of that saturated air? It's made up of the partial pressure contribution from the dry air and the contribution of the partial pressure from the vapor, true or false? What well, we just studied, true. We, that's, we're just extrapolating ideal gas mixtures and using it now for a binary mixture. One is dry and one is vapor. So this is true. So if this piston is still creating that the total pressure is 101.3 kilopascal and this vapor exerts maybe 2 kilopascal, guess what the dry air is at? Is it still exerting 101.3 kilopascal? No, it's less the partial pressure went down because the total pressure stayed constant. True? All right. So uh, as the amount of moisture goes up, what increases is the partial pressure of the vapor in that moist air mixture until it gets to a maximum. Guess when you get to the maximum? Guess where this is a maximum? when it's saturated, and we know that's the saturation pressure. So PV max is equal to PSAT, and where would, I, where would I find the saturation pressure in my thermodynamics appendices or textbook? Where would I find that PSAT, the saturation pressure for water, maybe at 50 degrees C or 20 degrees C or 15 degrees C or whatever temperature I'm at. The second table, the saturation, the steam table, okay? It's, 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 so this comes and it's only a function of the temperature. It's a temperature, temperature of my mixture. All right, so we find that out of our tables, our thermodynamic saturation steam tables. Take a look at also, once you've done a little Wikipedia research and are familiar with psychrometrics, uh, you want to also maybe review vapor pressure. I know that's discussed in our textbook, but uh, maybe it's nice to read it somewhere else. And here's this nice illustration of having a gas, having a liquid, the molecules going back and forth, coming in and out and exchanging, and then talking about that pressure, that equilibrium vapor pressure, okay? And you can even talk about, oh, boiling point, temperature. Do you remember the boiling point? For water, pure water, what's the boiling point temperature? 100 degrees C, meaning that that saturation pressure equals 1 atm when the temperature reaches 100 degrees C review those things. It's easy to get confused. So go take a look further down in that Wikipedia page about the boiling point of water. Notice that they even show a little quickie equation, Antoine's equation. A lot of times they code it up. If you don't have access to the steam tables, a lot of times there's an analytic expression or maybe they embed it in Excel code somewhere where you can just plug in the temperature and get out the pressure. Sometimes you got to be careful. They tell you to put the temperature in degrees C and expect the pressure in tor. Tor. How many tor is 1 atm? 760. 760, that's right. Here's a question. Calculate the vapor pressure of water at 1 atm pressure and 25 degrees C. If you have your table in front of you, you can look it up there, okay? Somebody have a table, just look it up quickly. What is the vapor pressure of water at 1 atm and 25 degrees C? So it's 0 0.03169 bar. I'd like that in kilopascal. How many kilopascal is that? 3.169 kilopascal, that's right, okay? So. Now, let me ask you this. Did you use this information about 1 atm? No. No. 
It's a distractor. It's irrelevant. I could have said, calculate the vapor pressure of water at noon on Wednesday at a pressure of 1 atm and a temperature of 25 degrees C. What? This, is a, this diagram right here they're trying to show you. They put tor and they put degree C. What are they plotting on the x-axis? Temperature. What are they plotting on the y-axis? Pressure. Don't forget that PT diagram starting especially from this point going out to this point from the TP to the CP. What? What's TP? What's CP? From the triple point to the critical point. And there's only one and only one saturation pressure for every given temperature. And there's only one and one saturation temperature for every given pressure. Okay? So one way of writing that is, is that P sat is a function of temperature only, or T sat is a function of pressure only. Right? So we're just reviewing that information that you've mastered already. <clears throat> Let's move on. Consider saturated air. That's a key word, saturated air. It has the most moisture that it can hold. And the partial pressure of the vapor in the uh, mixture, in the dry air water vapor mixture, that partial pressure of the vapor is equal to the saturation pressure. That's what it means when we say saturated air. Okay, it's at 20 degrees C and 101.3 kilopascal. Calculate the partial pressure of water. So somebody says, I need to know the partial pressure of the water. Maybe you use piece of W or maybe you say piece of V for V for vapor, water vapor, or PW for water. But the water behaves as an ideal gas and I want to know that pressure. Well, it only depends on that temperature, doesn't it? The answer is, so we look it up at 20 degrees C, it's 2.339 kPa. True? Yeah. So that's the answer for, I would put it like this, PV for part A. Now let's say, what is the answer for part B? What is the partial pressure of the nitrogen, assuming that 79% of the dry air is nitrogen? 79% of what's left. So we know that the total pressure is equal to the dry air partial pressure and the vapor pressure, or the partial pressure of the water, which is equal to the saturation pressure. Okay, so we know this is 101.3, we know this is 2.339, I'm able to get the dry air partial pressure, true? Once I know that, if I want to know its partial pressure of the nitrogen, it's gonna be the mole fraction of the nitrogen in the dry air times the partial pressure of the dry air. So it's going to be 0.79, 79% of that partial pressure of the dry air. And so the partial pressure of the dry air was uh, 98.96 kPa. Hence, the partial pressure of the nitrogen is equal to 78.18 kPa. I do the same thing for the oxygen. I find the partial pressure of the oxygen is equal to 20.78 kPa. What's a good way to check my work to see that I didn't make any errors? If I sum them all up, I better get back to 101.3, the total air pressure, true? So if you sum up the partial pressure of the oxygen, partial pressure of nitrogen, partial pressure of water vapor, you should get back to 101.3 kilopascal. And you do, and you do. Calculate the density of saturated air at the temp pressure of 1 atm, 101.3 kilopascal, and 25 degrees C, which is 298 Kelvin. How do I calculate the density of saturated air? 
So the density, let me struggle with the units. What are the, I use the symbol rho for density. What are the units of this? Kilogram of something. What is the kilogram of what? saturated air per cubic meter occupied by that saturated air okay if the saturated air is made up of dry air plus water vapor is that true or false true. it's true do you think that i could talk about the kilograms of saturated air being made up of the kilograms of dry air plus the kilograms of the vapor so think about one cubic meter out there existing and I look at that one cubic meter volume of saturated air and I say you know what inside that one cubic meter there's so many kilograms of dry air and so many kilograms of water vapor I sum them up I have so many kilograms of the saturated air total per meter cubed of volume so I say this is going to be the What's this in just thinking units here? Kilograms of dry air per meter cubed plus kilograms of vapor per meter cubed. That looks like I could calculate this by rho of the dry air plus rho of the vapor. Does that make sense? Sure. And could I use that this is the partial pressure of the dry air times the molar mass of the dry air divided by r bar t of the dry air and that this other one is the partial pressure of the vapor the molar mass of the vapor r bar t of the vapor now luckily the dry air temperature and the vapor temperature are the same thankfully there is no partial temperature concept in this te textbook. As far as I know, there's no partial temperature concept in engineering. That doesn't mean there may not be a partial temperature concept out there in physics. But in engineering, we're safe. Do we have a partial pressure concept? Yes, and we use it all the time, and we're using it right now. Do we have the partial volume concept? Yes, and we relate that back to the mole fractions for ideal gas mixtures. It's an extensive thing, an extensive property That's correct. It's an intensive property. The temperature is, and so there, but in thermal equilibrium, it's like the vapor is in thermal equilibrium with the dry air. They have the same temperature, so there's thankfully nothing. But there is, this pressure right here is not the same as that pressure. That is definitely not true. They're different pressures. And the molar masses are not the same. The molar mass of dry air, 28.97. Molar mass of water vapor, 18.02. So what we do is we substitute our numbers. Uh, I first have to say the total pressure is this. I get the, um, the, the saturation pressure at 25 degrees C. I think we did that already. What was that, 3 point? 169 kPa. Hence, the dry air pressure is 98.131 kilopascal. So we know those values. And when we substitute and we plug the numbers in, what we find is we have 1.1474 kilograms of dry air per cubic meter. And we have 0 0.023 kilograms of water vapor per cubic meter. Both of those are kilograms per cubic meter, but it's kilogram of this and kilogram of that. Okay. And when we sum it up, we find that we get that the saturated air density is 1.170 kilograms of what? Saturated air per cubic meter. That's our final answer. Now, if I look back, I look and say, how big a contribution <coughs> is this compared to that? This is 2%. So you may not think that the water contributes a lot to the mass, but it can contribute 2% easily. If you get hot, humid air, middle of summer, you're down the Louisiana coast, Texas coast by Houston, guess what you're breathing? You're breathing quite a bit of mass of water every time you breathe. 
Two percent is not e it's, it's easy to breathe two percent water vapor. You could breathe five percent by mass water vapor. You could breathe ten percent by mass. Do you ever notice sometimes it's hard to breathe when it's hot and humid? And if you, you get older, I went to the doctor one time and they did a test on me and they said, oh, your lungs, you're good. Your lungs are the, the, like a 25-year-old, healthy adult 25-year-old lungs. That's great. Congratulations. You know, I was well over 25 when they did that test, right? But uh, when you start turning 60 and 70, your lungs don't work as well. <laughs> so it is, is even harder when you're ingesting, inhaling, I'm not ingesting, inhaling a lot of water vapor. That's why a lot of people move to the state of Arizona <laughs> when they vacation and get, get old, right? It's nice and dry. They feel young again, or they move to the mountains in Colorado. It's dry. They love it. All right. Yes, sir. That's correct. It's 100%. I'm going to get to humidity, but I'm kind of building slowly. A lot of times I put these concepts out and students kind of yawn. They're boring. I got this mastered. And I ask a simple question, which trips them up. Because it's not hard to ask a question that trips us up in engineering. But you've got to get the concept straight, so I'm getting there in humidity. But yes, this is 100% relative humidity. Is it safe to say anything? Yeah. That's true. This cubic volume is the same cubic volume that occupies the, the water vapor as well as the dry air occupies it. Dry bulb temperature. There's going to be three temperatures we have to deal with. We have to master. The easiest, the simplest is the dry bulb temperature. It's as if a thermometer is hanging on the wall. And down here is the bulb, and that bulb is not wet. It's dry. Okay. If I have a thermometer hanging in the wall of the house, it's showing 70 degrees at the, inside the house, 72 inside the house, 72 inside the house, right? Is that thermostat that's mounted on the wall of the home, is that displaying the dry bulb temperature? Is that telling me it's 72 degrees dry bulb temperature in the house? Yes or no? It is. It is. This is a simple concept. Dry bulb. But then... We get complex. All right, so ever go out in the morning, and in the morning, it looks like somebody took a garden hose and sprayed your car, and it, there's wetness, and you have to turn the windshield wiper on and wipe it or get it cleaned, right? Where did that water come from? There was no mischievous neighbor with a garden hose spraying your car. It dewed out, true? All right, ever take a beverage out of a cold refrigerator, set it on the table. A minute later, the can was nice and dry coming out of the fridge. A minute later, it's sweating. There's all sorts of condensation all over it. Where did that come from? From the moisture in the air that's surrounding that can. You ever walk across the grass in the early morning and your feet are wet, your shoes are wet? Where did that water come from? moisture in the air so at night what happens is it cools off and so the temperature drops and then all of a sudden the water that was uh, held in the air it becomes saturated air because the temperature drops and then it starts to do out as the temperature continues to drop during the night it lands settles on your car settles on the grass settles wherever okay settles on the roof here you have air in the room it's fairly moist and warm. You put it in the presence of a cold surface, the moist air right adjacent to it cools down, it gets to the saturation temperature, it gets to the dew point temperature, and then it, the, the water that's in this little pack of air close to the can condenses and attaches itself to the can and forms little droplets. Hopefully that appeals to you. So we have mastered the dry bulb temperature. This is now the dew point temperature. The temperature drops until it hits the point at which it dews out some of the water. Not all the water. It dews out some of the water, the excess above the what it can be saturated. So it can be thought of like, a, like as the temperature decreases, the air becomes like super saturated? Yep. It's just getting off the excess water. So it becomes saturated. That's super saturated. It can't be super saturated, so it the water droplets hit each other, they coalesce into big drops, 
and then in the presence of gravity they fall out or they attach themselves to something on the side. So same with the glass window. A uh, glass window on a cold winter day, the inside of your house, you go up to it, you can rub, you can write your name in it because of all the moisture. Okay? Well, that's what you're doing. You're, you're, you're observing all that interior moisture. Here's a problem. Moist air at 25 degrees C fills a room, like this room. 25 degrees C, not hot, not cold. Three cans of soda are placed on the table in the room. One, two, three. The cans are at different temperatures. Maybe you got them out of different fridges. One is 5 degrees C. That's the coldest can. The next one's 10 degrees C, and the next one's 15 degrees C. All are colder than the air in the room. True? Which can is more likely to have water drops form on the surface of the can? The colder can. Because the air real close to that cold can will co cool off because of the cooling the heat transfer between the air packet next to the cold can, and as it cools off, it's less capable of holding a lot of moisture because PV is a function of T, T sat. I mean, uh, P, um, here, let me back up. PV is equal to P sat if it's saturated air, and that dramatically goes down as temperature goes down. It can't hold a lot of water. Same question. Modify a little bit. We have moist air, same temperature, fills the room. Three soda cans are placed on the table. The can is 5 degrees, 10 degrees, 15 degrees. Water drops are observed on the first can, but not on can two or three. The dew point temperature of the air in the room is, is it below 5? Is it equal to 5? Is it between 5 and 10? Is it between 10 and 15 or above 15 degrees C? We have a lot of votes for C. Do you like that one? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Now, I modify the question a little bit. Dew drops are on the first can and the second can, but the third can is dry. What do we conclude about the dew point temperature of the air in the room? It's between 10 and 15. See what we did? So this new temperature is the dew point temperature. It's the dew point temperature of the air in the room. And we observe what happens when we bring cold surfaces into it, into the air in the room, like a cold surface of a can. And if that cold surface of a can is below the dew point, you're going to get condensation on that can. If the window surface temperature is lower than the dew point of the air in the room, you're going to get condensation on that window. Right? Okay. If you have a big room or outdoor air and its temperature, dry bulb is known, temperature, dew point is known, and somehow you cool it by radiative cooling overnight. That's how things cool off at night. There's no sun, clear sky, it radiates out, and we cool off, right? If the temperature of the dry bulb drops to the dew point and then tries to drop more because if it's cooling, you will get dew. Dew forming on the grass, dew forming on the cars. There's one other temperature that we need to be exposed to. It's the wet bulb temperature. How many temperatures do we have now? Three, Three temperatures. Dry bulb, easy. Dew point, I got to think about it, but I have a lot of experience. Anybody have glasses? They are, I mean, when do your glasses fog up? When you're in a hot, not, oh, let me back up. When you're in a hot, humid house and you walk out to a cold outside, is that when they fog up? Or when you're outside in the cold and you walk into a hot, humid house, which one is it? The second one, isn't it? Your glasses are cold. They're very, very cold. And when you bring that cold surface into the room inside your home, that cold surface temperature is below the dew point of the air in the room. And so then you get some of the moisture in the room condense on your glasses, and it's, it's annoying. Yeah, yeah. 
All right, now the next one is a wet bulb temperature. The best way to describe the wet bulb temperature is with a sling psychrometer. Sling psychrometer. I don't have one. I'll bring one to class. And what you do is grab a handle like this, and you twirl it around, okay? Now, think about, first of all, the dry bulb. It's as if I had this thermometer on the wall, right? I had the thermometer on the wall. I then take it off the wall, and I start slinging it around in the air. I stop. I look at the thermometer. Did the temperature on the thermometer change because I was slinging it around in the air? No, it didn't. That's a big conclusion, okay? Some people will say, well, if it's cold air and I'm slinging it around, won't it feel colder? You're confusing the person who wants to stay at a constant body temperature, and now the body has to work harder to stay at that constant temperature when it's really cold outside and the wind is blowing. It's wind chill, right? But if the thermometer doesn't care, it just says, I'll measure the temperature and report it to you, right? It's not trying to stay warm. And so when you sling it around, the dry bulb temperature will stay the same. What you will measure on that thermometer that's not covered with any moisture is the dry bulb temperature of the room. But they have another thermometer, and they put a little like a cloth surface on it. It's a little wicking material. And they get it wet, and they have a little reservoir, not much of a reservoir, to keep it wet. Now, when they sling it around because it's wet, do you think the temperature on the wet bulb will be the same as the temperature on the dry bulb? No. Do you think it'll be hotter or colder? You have a lot of experience with that. Why will it be colder? I'm looking for another word. Why will it be lower temperature? Heat transfer. Evaporation. Evaporation. Everybody knows that's why you have wet t-shirts, right? And that's to promote the heat transfer from your body. Your actually body trying to preserve itself will sweat so that there'll be something to evaporate. <laughs> Okay, think about this. This is getting a little digression. What is the internal temperature of the core temperature of your body for a healthy individual? 98.4 degrees F. Okay. True? Okay. Let's say this. Anybody ever been in, an, uh, in Texas when it's over 100 degrees F? Easy. All right. When you're sick and you're running a fever, right? You ever remember, like, okay, I had a 100 degree F fever, 102 degrees F fever? That's pretty sick. When should you take a child to the hospital? When they're about 104 ish? No, that's your own call. But don't let that child go up over 104. You better not. Because what will happen up here to the brain? Damage. And so you're cooked that brain. Now, anybody been in Texas in the summer when it's over 105? Yes, I have. How does that body work? Isn't it 105? My body, the inside of it's trying to stay 98.4. Isn't the heat trying to go that way? And yet, if I'm trying to do a little shovel work out in the Texas sun, like a lot of the construction guys on the side of the road, and you joke, hey, look at him, he's leaning on his shovel. Believe me, I would be leaning on my shovel too. There's no shade, and it's over 100. And he can barely do anything, and his body is fighting to stay healthy at 98.4. His brain does not need to boil. How is this going to work? The only saving mechanism is he will absorb heat from the surroundings. He's got to reject that plus all of his metabolism heat. And when he's working, he's putting out a lot more. <coughs> you are put out a lot more than when you're sleeping. You're working, you are dumping heat all over the place, okay? And it's got to, you. so it, he sweats up a storm and that evaporative cooling cools him and keeps him from, from really suffering, okay? So this temperature is going to drop. Now, do you think it'll drop more when it's slung around in dry air? The dry bulb, the wet bulb temperature will be much below the dry bulb if it's dry air. Do you think it will drop at all if this room that I'm slinging around is saturated, there's no potential to evaporate. So what will happen is, is the wet bulb temperature, if it's the same as the dry bulb, I conclude when I walk into a room and sling it around, 
that it's saturated air. And then they have a little scale. They worked it all out. We can work it out in the next lecture or so that you see the two temperatures, you compare them, and then you can infer the humidity. You can get the humidity. Next time, we'll talk more.